I am just so honored to have Suzanne Humphreys here. Um, I, I feel like she needs little introduction because so many people know, know her, but I'll, I'll, introduce, I'll introduce her. <laughs> um, Suzanne's a conventionally educated medical doctor um, who was a participant in the conventional hospital system from 1989 until 2011. Um, and in that, she has two books. One's called Dissolving Illusion, which is what her, her talk is on today. Um, and the other one is Rising from the Dead, which tells her autobiography um, and that story of coming out of the sort of Western medicine and, and recognizing that vaccines are not the greatest thing on earth um, and sort of going through that process. Um, today, she's going to talk about polio, um, the untold story. That's what her book, Dissolving Illusions, if you haven't read Dissolving Illusions, it's a phenomenal book um, that goes through many things, but part of it is sort of the history of polio. Um, and one of the things that I find when I, whenever I talk about vaccines and not vaccinating my kids, especially from the older generation, the question is, but what about polio? And then, you know, it's, it's this hype that really is, is uh, there's a whole different story. And Suzanne is the one person that I found has just completely taken that and has all of the research and the history of that. And, and I will say what, the other thing that I love about Suzanne is that there is nothing that comes out of her mouth that isn't documented by some research article. So you really can't argue with her. And I love that. So Suzanne, thank you for coming and thank you for being here and sharing it. Well, today's going to be a departure from everything Christina just said, actually, because I'm going to talk about some things that would be considered hearsay that I won't have uh, PMID numbers after. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is not in the book, because I thought that most of you would have read the chapter online, which is actually free. And so I figured I'd give you something new. Um, so, you know, a lot of the information... Okay, so why did I start studying polio so intensively? Because I did. Um, it was because when I saw problems in my own patients after influenza vaccines and, the, you know, all the doubt came upon me, everybody just kept bringing up the polio vaccine, which I knew almost nothing about except for who invented it, the two different um, inventors of the two different vaccines. So I thought, well, let me look into this because maybe that is the one good vaccine. I have no idea. And if it was the one good vaccine, I would have gone that way. I w it wasn't like I had any um, predetermined idea about it at all. And what I found was like a really deep, dark history that pretty much shocked me. And there was a lot that I couldn't put into the book because it didn't have PMID number after it. And it's just such juicy, good information that I think people need to know more of this untold history. And so a lot of history doesn't get put into the books because it doesn't support the paradigms that we're all supposed to be believing. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is anecdotal. It came from word of mouth. Uh, it's, I would say it's second generation information from uh, two people back in the day who were alive when this polio vaccine was being developed and uh, worked actually in Dr. Salk's lab. That would be Dr. Robert Mendelson and Dr. Anthony Morris, who were actually friends with a friend of mine who's still living. And um, she has told me a great deal about uh, some of what they told her. So I'll, you'll know which you know, parts of this talk involve that. So sometimes we're just left with word of mouth and with newspaper clippings and small mentions of events in larger works. So this is pretty much what I covered in a previous talk before the book came out. Um, and I'm not gonna cover much of this today. So, but those of you who aren't familiar with the polio history, just know that there was um, you know, a really broad diagnosis before the vaccine was developed, and then they limited the diagnostic criteria. So whether or not they invented a vaccine or not, the polio would have gone down precipitously just based on that manipulation. And that there were other toxic influences that could have looked exactly like poliomyelitis, whether there was a polio virus or not. And I talk extensively about that in Dissolving Illusions. There was the issue of provocation polio. So when polio virus was circulating, the theory was that if you invaded the tonsils, you were giving direct ac ac you know, access to the brain stem. So bulbar polio could be a, a big problem. It was obvious that sometimes in the arm where there was any injection, whether there was a substance in, the, in there or not, it was the needle actually, that could lead to paralysis of that limb if polio was circulating. So that was called provocation polio. And then um, 
There was also a big change in the susceptibility to polio after tonsillectomies. Um, sugar was a main thing. There were, there were some researchers that were looking into low sugar diets and the susceptibility, and they did find that when they put communities on low sugar diets that the uh, polio rates went down, but um, that was largely ignored. And then the whole makeover, the, the, you know, the iron lung has changed today. We have a ventilator, we have new diagnostic methods. So most of that is all covered in uh, dissolving illusions. So today I want to talk about some new things that I haven't uh, talked about at least this way in public, and it will involve that list right there. And I will not dwell on that because I'm about to talk about it. So this is a graph from Dissolving Illusions, and if you don't know, the color graphs are available on our website, dissolvingillusions.com. It was just cost prohibitive to put them in the book, so they're in black and white in the book, and they are not as good as when you look here. But what I want to show you here, so these were the disease incidences, not the death rates, but the disease incidences for some of the major infectious diseases. Um, between 1912 and 1969. So measles is, is the green line, and then smallpox is in there, but I want to draw your attention down here to the maroon line at the bottom, and you see there's a peak at 1916, and then it stays really low. This is the polio part. And then around 1953, we see an, another peak and then it comes down again. The vaccine trials were in 1954. The first vaccine was released in 1955. And so I just want to point, point out that, you know, it was a relatively low incidence disease. Uh, and it's kind of hard to believe when we think back on all the images and the reputation that the vaccine has. Uh, so polio outbreaks were first reported in the USA in 1843. And that was right around the time that a lot of alterations in infant care and agriculture occurred. And, and, and I'm not going to get into that today, but that's all recorded in the book. In, in 1954, there was a peak in the USA with 21,000 cases of paralytic polio, depending on how that polio was defined. <clears throat> so let's take a magnified look at that bottom line. So this is that bottom maroon line magnified. And again, I want you to look at this 1916 peak. And, and this is my opinion, that this 1916 peak really freaked out the world, and especially the United States. And after that 1916 epidemic, the public was pretty much willing to go to any extent to get rid of polio. And in 2011, an article came out by Dr. H. V. Wyatt, who did actually a lot of writing about provocation polio. But this one was a little bit of a, um, a, a turn from what he usually wrote about. And he talked about this 1916 epidemic. And he talked about the difference between, between the history that he and others had uncovered and the history that we all just heard about, which was this horrible 1916 epidemic where there were 23,000 cases and 5,000 deaths. That was actually the highest case fatality ever recorded in history. So why is that? Well, it's because it was a particularly virulent strain of, of virus. The paralysis rate was 2% among two to three year olds. Again, that's the highest rate recorded anywhere in the world. And it occurred well before the summer polio season. So again, it wasn't characteristic. It wasn't the typical thing. Something was very different about this. And so the, the blame was placed on some Italian <coughs> immigrant children um, as the index cases. And it turned out later, um, actually within the past 20 years, that uh, the history books from, I guess it was Ellis Island, were reviewed, and it turned out that those Italian children came after the epidemic started. So that actually wasn't true at all. So what happened? Well, there was a big frenzy, and they, were, they killed 72,000 cats that year just to control polio. I mean, people went crazy during these epidemics, even in the 1950s. They would put barriers up to letting new children into towns. They shut down movie theaters. They shut down pools, and uh, so, what, what Wyatt talked about here is that three miles from the epicenter of the outbreak, Simon Flexner, who was one of the famous polio and vaccine people in general, microbiologist, and his associates at the Rockefeller Institute at 63rd Street and New York Avenue, near the Queensboro Bridge on Manhattan Island, had been passaging spinal cord tissue containing polio virus from one rhesus monkey spinal cord to another. They were unable to infect the monkeys just by feeding them. 
So these experiments continued with the passage of virus, which at times was reinforced with newly acquired virus from human patients. So the passage of virus from monkey spinal cord to monkey spinal cord selects for neural mutants, okay? So for highly virulent mutants, and they were plucking them out and selecting them. So in natural infections, poliovirus tends to um, fade out uh, as it does in humans, like it, it, it did eventually in 1916. So the question is, how did the virus travel the three miles, okay? So the epicenter here was three miles from the Rockefeller Center. Well, what Wyatt reported was that a few blocks in the Rockefeller Institute at Lexington Avenue and 63rd Street, the 3rd Avenue elevated line linked at Municipal Building Station to the BRT line in Brooklyn over the Brooklyn Bridge with a stop at 3rd Street and 5th Avenue where the first case lived. And the suspicion was that it was, you know, a lot of these laboratory workers really weren't very highly trained and probably weren't as careful as they could have been. And so um, the suspicion is that, his suspicion is that one of the laboratory workers walked out with this strain on them, in them somehow, and spread it around. But the problem is that they were developing this virulent strain. That was the actual purpose, was to, to, to cultivate a highly neurovirulent strain of polio virus. And even Dr. Wyatt says, in the middle of the largest polio epidemic ever seen, these doctors wrote that passage of this virus will be continued with the hope of increasing its virulence. And he even questioned why are they doing this? And we still don't know exactly why they were doing this. Um, so. Just keep that in the back of your head, and let's skip up to uh, a, a, a tribe of Indians that live deep in the <coughs> eastern Mato Grosso in Brazil. And these Indians generally stayed far away from white culture. And if the common civilization tried to move towards them, they would just slaughter them. So they didn't, they, so eventually the white man decided we have got to stay away. But somehow, I think it was around the 1940s, this guy, Neil, um, was able to get close enough to, to these Indians that he was able to get stool samples and blood samples. Can you imagine what this tribe thought when this white man comes in and starts asking for their stool? But that's pretty much what happened. So, um, what he discovered was that all of the 60 people that were tested with both techniques had antibodies to type 1 poliovirus. 98.3% had antibodies to type 2 and 93.3% to type 3. So pretty interesting that this tribe that's living out all by themselves, out of communication, um, has antibody virtually 100% protection, or I should say response, having met this virus at some point, and none of them are sick. There's no history of polio, there's no paralysis, and they said that they were immune to all three types of polio and there was no disease. So, you know, a lot of people have suspected that polio virus is just a normal commensal. And it was only under certain circumstances where this paralysis could have occurred. And I think that this is a pretty strong case that supports that. And uh, the, so he, they, Neil said, the paradox of virtual absence of paralytic poliomyelitis among such heavily infected groups despite high antibody titers is well known. And so this wasn't the only group of natives that they found to be immune. And they, they also tested salmonella influenza and they found the same thing was true in a lot of these different tribes. Um, so Sabin said something interesting that's relating to this, and he said, why did paralytic poliomyelitis become an epidemic disease only a little more than 50 years ago? And as such, why does it seem to be affecting more and more the countries in which sanitation and hygiene, along with the general standard of living, are presumably making the greatest advances, while other large parts of the world, regardless of latitude, are still relatively unaffected? And the distinguishing aspect of the servicemen eluded Sabin, at least it seemed to have eluded him in his writings. But all one had to do was look at a poster like this, which was how the servicemen were prepared before, um, you know, after they were recruited, and they pretty much got DDT and they sprayed it in their clothing, in their hats, in their faces, and they, this is pretty much an instruction manual for how to spray the new recruits. So they also found that their families became more susceptible and then surrounding villages weren't affected even though in many cases the locals were intermixing with the soldiers and their families. So, you know, when you put this all together, I think there's a really strong case to be made for refined sugar, for cigarettes, refined flour, um, and lack of basic pesticide-free produce that can be made. 
And then there's the flip example of the susceptibility was Dr. Archie Kalokarinos, who was in Australia dealing with the, the Aboriginal um, you know, health problems, which were significant during his time as a medical doctor. And he found it so depressing that he actually went off and became an opal miner for a while. And then he did go back to practicing again. But he said that an Aboriginal elder told him, Archie, these diseases that white man brought, we never had them before. We have no Aboriginal words for them. Before the white man came, we had good health and no sickness. Well, the white man came to Australia and pretty much moved the Aborigines into really harsh living circumstances, cut them off from their normal diet, gave them um, sausages that were going bad, flour that was laced with arsenic, and told the mothers to stop breastfeeding and gave them all powdered milk instead. So, and jam, jam and bread was the other part of their diet. So it was pretty disastrous. And he documents this very eloquently in his book, Every Second Child. <clears throat> so that's kind of just the background on polio and some of the things that we don't hear very often. Now, this is what we would have seen most growing up uh, or thereafter. I mean, it was about 10 years before I was born is when these posters were really popular. And so the public in the 1940s and 50s, um, because there was still this legacy of the 1916 epidemic and this horrible potential problem with paralysis, the public was led to believe that these images were caused by polio virus and that the only viable solution was a vaccine. So, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was pretty much the, you know, poster man for the um, for the March of Dimes, which began as something called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. Some of the insiders called it um, the National, uh, how, that national they, they, they juxtaposed it, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. No, I'm going to get this wrong. The Foundation for National Paralysis. It was something they were basically making a joke that, um, that it came after the 1954 vaccine. When the, after 1955, there were more cases of polio from the vaccine than there were from the wild type viruses. Um, so these images were used to instill fear in parents all over the world and to elicit donations to the cause, the dimes to come in. And so while fear was ruling the land, DDT was being spread, pools were being closed, movie theaters were being shut down, and these images were being um, pretty much broadcast on television. Posters were up all over the country. And you know, this is, a, this is a, a picture here that I was very familiar with, but I look at it, looked at it more critically after I started researching polio more. And I looked at it and I thought, there's no cords, there's no power cords. <laughs> and and the, like, the nurses aren't wearing masks. And gosh, what's going on here? And then sure enough, like after I wrote the book, I found this. Um, Miss Smithsonian, it's actually on the Smithsonian Institution's website, and it says the scene was staged for film. It's not historically accurate as a respirator ward, but it is an example of an established photographic technique of directing the viewer's response by creating a shot that would not naturally occur. Um, here is, this is a real scene, and there's a movie kind of clip that goes with this, but I didn't put it there. Um, so this is not a propaganda film or a picture. This actually really happened. And the kids liked to run through the stream of DDT that was being spread at the beaches. And then this was actually a Time Magazine ad. Um, DDT is good for me, E.E. -E. It actually had a song that went with it. So this is what the public, you know, they were, mothers were spraying DDT on, in the lunch boxes. It would be, they would be sprayed while they were eating lunch at school. It was put in the sandwiches. Um, arsenic was actually thought to be healthy, good for you, good for children. People were putting it in cigarette tobacco to smoke to help with lung conditions. Mercury was being injected as therapeutics. Um, so all while this was happening, there was this big push to get to develop a vaccine. And so the, the, Jonas Salk was recruited. Basically, his job was to figure out how to inactivate the polio virus and get it into an injection. He couldn't even do that right. We'll get to that in a minute. But this, the Salk facts, that, so the, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which became the March of Dimes, hired a man named Thomas Francis to conduct this big field trial in 1954 where they looked at different children. Some had the vaccine, some had what they called a placebo. I worked and worked to try to find out exactly what was in that. To the best of my knowledge, it was just saline, but I'm not really sure. And then there was a group that got no injections at all. 
and they compared them, and it was a large-scale operation, really large, hundreds of thousands of kids. But before the, the, before the you know, announcement was made, which was a big theatrical thing that happened in 1954 in Ann Arbor, Michigan, you know, the, the hype and the hope and the drama that occurred was so huge that this trial couldn't fail. It, it just, if they did, the, the entire, you know, paradigm and, and the, the way that vaccines were viewed would have fallen completely apart. So there was no way, no matter how bad this trial was, that it would fail. And this trial today wouldn't even, wouldn't even be considered a trial. You know, there were so many problems with it. The results actually weren't released for three years after it was broadcast as a success. So, okay, so then there's 1954. The trial happens 1955. There's the big television thing that happened. Everyone in the whole country was tuned into the TV this day when this was when this was discussed. And so these these were some of the um, some of the newspaper clippings that happened afterwards, showing that the polio vaccine was a success. You see Jonas Salk holding the vials, and you know everybody's celebrating because they're finally going to put an end to this terrible plague with the crippled children. And so it was considered an international spectacle of Hollywood proportions. And this is, this is another uh, article that was staged for the Smithsonian Institute website. And, and on there, they say that this is an element of cruel insensitivity, but that the intensity of the relief that people felt when an effective vaccine was found was pretty much worth that. Um, so what happened is that in 1955, this announcement was made, and then they had to license the vaccine. And so what they did is they gathered a group of experts. I think they brought them to, to Maryland or around D.C. somewhere. And they gave them one day. They put them in a room and they said, you, you're going to go over the results and we want you to, to pass this through, license it. Well, before it was licensed, there were some 9 million vaccines already produced and bought by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis ready for release. Okay, so there was no way that people in that room were going to say no to it. And it's really interesting. And I, I do have a lot of quotes in the book about... Um, what happened in that room that day, some of the reports. They, they were basically given two hours to deliberate the results, which they actually didn't even have the full results. They were just told that Jonas Salk said it was good, that we need it now, pass it, pass it, pass it. Um, the licensing committee didn't get to see the full data or really any data. The committee members were pressured into an early decision that they didn't want to do. They were told that if they wanted to deliberate any longer that they would have to go home and fly back, and they didn't want to do that. So the vaccine was immediately licensed. 27 million doses, not nine actually, 27 million doses were made and ready to inject that same day. Uh, the physicians were ordered to inject the fast-track vaccine before they knew anything about it, the science of it, or the trial. And the Francis report, which was the big report, um, it's about that thick. I actually made a copy of it. It's an absolute nightmare to get through. But that wasn't released until 1957. Kind of weird. So nobody got to really take a good, long analysis of this until 1957. And lots of problems happened in 1955, some of which you may be familiar with. You may know the term the Cutter incident. Well, that was just one part of it. So this guy's really interesting. So if, if anyone anyone's familiar with psychology, this is one of the inventors of the Myers-Briggs test. Um, so he was a statistician. And there's this really interesting article, um, a conversation with Paul Meyer by Marx. And in that, um, he ta Paul Meyer talks about what it was like trying to, to give any advising to this group of people that was hell-bent on getting this vaccine past and what Jonas Salk was like to deal with as the leader of this lab. And so he says Jonas Salk had a paper in which he argued that all the virus was inactivated and that there was no live virus, but the sixth lot was not listed. And so I said that something was wrong. He cut out data in order not to show what happened to some lots. The National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis did not form an advisory committee and they reformed it sorry, did form an advisory committee, and they reformed it five or six times. Each time somebody didn't agree, they dropped them and got somebody who might agree. By the time they were done formatting the committee, everyone on it was distinguished, but very agreeable. <laughs> yes. So one of the problems was with this vaccine, they used formaldehyde to inactivate it. 
And then they would check, there was a color test that they used to check for live viruses in the vaccine. And they would, so Jonas Salk said it was a linear inactivation curve, and he insisted on it. And there were Swedish scientists trying to say, no, 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 it's not linear, it's a, there's a curve. And this guy here was trying to say, no, it's not linear, it's a curve. And Jonas Salk said, it's linear, it's linear, it's linear, and this is how it's going to be, and shut up. And that's why they had to keep turning over the advisory committees. But what happened was that the formaldehyde would really just kind of tan the outside of the viruses or the virus clumps. And that in two weeks, that test could be negative for live viruses, but then months later, or even years later, that vaccine in the vial could come back to life because the formaldehyde could come off of it, the nucleic acid could come off from the inside, and it was able to come back to life. And so this was a major problem, and it became a problem in 1955, um, and I'll get to that in a moment. So um, Dr. Fred Klenner, if you've never heard of him, is a very important person for lots of reasons. He was one of the lone voices of dissent. Uh, he was curing 100% of paralytic polio cases, according to his records, by using intravenous vitamin C. And those records are on the internet. You can download those articles for free. And he wrote a scathing review of the Francis Report, absolutely scathing. Uh, because he was very awake to the whole drama that was going on. And I'd love to read you the whole thing, but I won't. So I'm just going to read you some, some parts of it, because um, it's a real classic article. And he was actually a very brilliant guy. He also was somebody who was giving uh, high doses of vitamin C to pregnant women and documenting the outcomes as well. And I'll talk about that tomorrow <clears throat> in the vitamin C talk. So he says here, once again, we have Dr. Arrowsmith, the would-be Gottlieb, the, see, he's too smart for me, I don't understand what any of this means, the Hollabird and the McGurk Institution. The story of the drama is so much alike that incredible as it might be, it seems that those producing the play today have copied from the pen of Sinclair Lewis. An anniversary day was assigned for the release of this breathtaking information, just as was the sumptuous Capitola McGurk's dinner for the release of the information of the wonderful Phage. The results await statistical analysis and should have this before they are published. So wrote Sinclair Lewis in 1925, so went the contrived propaganda in 1953. It becomes rather amusing when we note the special interest and recommendations of one congressman, Pickerball, Dr. Ellis S. Sox, Health Commissioner of San Francisco, summed it up rather well when he charged that the polio vaccination program was being handled like a soap opera. He told the National Foundation that half of his time now was spent nullifying the hysteria that they create. Well, this was just the beginning. It was just getting wound up at this point. Um, so this came out in 1955. Uh, um, he says, the time has come when honest men must stand up and challenge those among us who would destroy us for lust of gold. He knew this was a huge money-making operation. Figures released through the United Press show when reduced to absolute percent that the results were the same whether vaccinated, given dummy shots, or just observed. In fact, the combined total cases in the 11 placebo states and the 33 control states were exactly as published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The Associated Press report indicates an apparent protection in the vaccinated group of 0.01%. And then he goes on to show this chart just to demonstrate that four different publications had, had such diversely different numbers that they came out with because nobody had the actual data when they were talking about it. They were all just going on what Tommy Francis said and what Jonas Salk said. Jonas Salk came out saying it's probably 60 to 70 percent effective, but next year it will be 100 percent because he decided to take the merthiolate out, which is a mercury compound that was in the original vaccine in 1954, wasn't quite strong enough for him, the vaccine. So he took out that merthiolate to make the virus stronger, and he left in the most virulent strain of polio known, which is called the Mahoney strain. So in 1955, without any um, need for special testing before licensing this vaccine to be released. They changed it from what it was in 1954. They took the merthiolate out, which made that um, Mahoney strain be able to really 
um, wreak havoc, and that's why the 1955 problem happened. But Clowney didn't know about this yet because the full publication hadn't come out. He just talked about the enormous variation in what the reports were. And then he goes on to say that one might ask the reason for so many reports so different in detail because no given set of reporters would have or could have selected such specific tidbit data on the spur of the moment from the total report. Dr. Francis said, from those data, it is not possible to select a single value given numerical expression in a complete sense to the effectiveness of the vaccine as total experience. It may be suggested that vaccination was 80 to 90% effective. And then he says, if 80 to 90% is not a numeric expression, then someone somewhere needs schooling. <laughs> and so he again is imploring the physicians around him, pay attention, there's something, there's a rat in the kitchen here. Well, this was the result of the medical community to Dr. Klenner. And it was the result when he stood up at a polio meeting and said, I've cured 100% of my paralytic polio patients. It went right past them. So there were a few good doctors like Dr. Herbert Ratner, Dr. Bernard Greenberg from North Carolina, Dr. Benjamin Sandler, and a few other critical thinkers that continued to write along the same lines that, that um, Dr. Klenner was. This is Dr. Herbert Ratner, one of my favorites. I actually inherited his entire library, which was like an amazing gift and made me realize I, I was doing, I was supposed to be researching polio. So I have all of his original papers. I have them in paper form and in electronic form. And so these, this actually, this whole bundle is available online right now. Uh, a premature salt vaccine it really should be read by everyone. Again, he's saying this is a plea to you not to commit the Illinois State Medical Society in any manner to any endorsement of the salt vaccine program promoted by the NFIP and the USPHS. U.S. physicians are only hearing what the NFIP and the USPHS want you to hear and as a result are no more knowledgeable than the layman unless you are willing to do what the American Medical Association has just done, namely appoint a committee to carefully survey the literature. And he goes on and on and on with all kinds of detail. Um, so this is another classic one and this is the response by the medical community that Dr. Ratner got. So this comes from one of his articles, uh, The Present Status of Polio Vaccines, another classic. Um, so in the fall of 1955, Dr. Alexander Langmuir, who is considered the father of modern epidemiology in the United States, predicted that by 1951, um, sorry, that must be 1961, I have a typo. By 1961, there would be less than 100 cases of paralytic polio in the United States. So four, after four years and 300 million doses of Salk vaccine, in 1959, they actually had 6,000 cases of paralytic polio, 1,000 of which were in persons who had received three, four, or more shots of Salk vaccine. So you can see over here on the left, this is the year 57, 58, 59. Um, these are the cases, 2,000, 3,000, 6,000. So what's going on there? And so there was a 164% increase there. So, you know, Dr. Ratner had the data and he was just really sounding the alarm bells and nobody was listening to him. So early in the year, um, 1955, there was evidence. So this was the first year that they used kind of the unbridled vaccine that had the Mahoney strain without the methylate. So what I want to show you here is that, um, I have to magnify mine so I can point to the right direction. Um, so if you look at 1954, so here's the peak of the 1954, follow that down, it's just a nice smooth curve, okay? So there's no pre-season peak in 1954, but look at 1955, 1955 is here, let's follow it backwards, look at this right here, boom, there's this pre-season peak right here, it's called the Salk vaccine post-inoculation, should be pre-inoculation, uh, poliomyelitis phenomenon. So there's this, this bump here, and this is related to the vaccine. And you can see that each year it gets a little smaller, but it's still there. Here's 56, 59. So it's still there. And there's a reason why the peak is still there and why it goes down each year. I'm gonna tell you about it soon, just a few minutes. So um, this happened pre-seasonally following mass vaccinations and um, this phenomenon was independently recognized by epidemiologists of the Federal Health Ministry of West Germany. And when the sponsors of the Salk vaccine were forced to take action in 1955 because testing continued to detect live polio virus in the Salk vaccine, the US 
Public Health Service issued a manufacturing requirement. So everything changed after the Qatar incident. Even though what we found out later, it wasn't just Qatar, it was Wyeth, and that all the vaccine companies were actually having trouble inactivating the vaccine. So what they did is they said, okay, well, initially we wanted to have no tissue culture infective doses. So we had this strange way of determining how many virions were allowed in each dose. And it was supposed to be none. But then they decided they were going to let less than five in each dose. And they, they were going to take care of this problem here with this live um, virus by doing filtrations. And they said, well, this will get rid of the clumps that are in the vaccine. So we're going to keep filtering and filtering and filtering. What they ended up doing is they filtered it so much because the vaccine companies were terrified. They saw a cutter go down. And nobody wanted to manufacture this vaccine anymore. So they said, we're just going to filter the heck out of it. And what they ended up with was pretty much water in the end. So they had a vaccine that wasn't causing it the paralysis that used to, as you can see here, because the, the humps go down, down, down. But it also had no antigen, pretty much no antigen left in it either. So that's what they did in order to um, escape that problem that was pretty much terrifying all the vaccine companies, and in order to maintain the wonderful name of the polio vaccine. So people were still signing up, getting this vaccine, three doses of it for all their kids, except for a few crazy, quack, tree-hugging parents who didn't think it was a good idea. <laughs> and so here's the German report suggesting that no compulsory, this is just, just showing you that this German report, this is a translation that I got from Herbert Ratner's archives. Um, and they said that no compulsory vaccination should take place and that all parents should only elect to vaccinate after full informed consent. Uh, the report also stated that the placebos in the Francis trial had an inordinate number of polio cases. And Klenner described also that the placebo vaccine had more cases than the children who had no injections at all. And that was, that was what happened. So the, the, the cases, so there was the children had no injections, the placebo, and the polio vaccine. And they looked at it in different parts of the country. And I didn't have time to get into this and dissolving illusions. Uh, but this, that's why it took so long to get to put this report out, because I really think the data had to really be shifted around in order to show this 80 to 90 percent benefit. Because what happened was those children who got the, even the injection, probably because of provocation polio, ended up with trouble just from the needle. So the, the kids that had the least were the ones that had no injections at all. And there were some areas where the placebo actually had more um, polio than those who got the vaccine. Can you just go back, sorry, to the, the graph and say again, so it dropped because they were diluting out, but then why did it go up again? After? No. Okay, so this is one curve. This is 1955. It goes like this, up, down, and up. Yeah. Okay, so this is the pre-season peak. This is when the vaccine was given. Yeah. And then this was just the regular seasonal polio that came through. And it's all mishmash here, but you can see here, this is another curve. Here, it goes like this, 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 and this. And each, oh. each year, it gets lower, the preseason peak, because they were filtering out the, the, you know, pretty much everything out of the vaccines. So it means that polio cases were coming in the summer. They gave the vaccine in the springtime. Can I show this to you afterwards? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah because I'm only not even halfway through Sorry. yet. <laughs> okay, so Salks, basically this was, um, this was the Swedish scientist Svengard um, who wrote this uh, paper called Prophylactic Vaccination Against Poliomyelitis, 1956. And again, they were trying to tell Jonas Salk back in the time that there was a problem. And so he wouldn't listen, so they just basically went public and started doing writing on their own, saying Salk's basic hypothesis is false. As early as the Poliomyelitis Congress in Rome in September 1954, Swedish observations were put forward concerning virus inactivation with formaldehyde, which showed that the inactivation curve is not a straight line, but shows a continuous curvature. The phenomenon, meaning the, the polio paralysis phenomenon, um, has nothing to do with the presence of aggregates. Filtration does not in any way affect the shape of the curve. Um, so he was saying that the problem is that the formaldehyde was not inactivating the way it should, that, that the excuse was, oh, but there's clumping, and if we just get rid of the clumping, all will be fine. We'll inject the single virus particles that are inactivated by formaldehyde. Okay, so a lot of other countries decided, especially in Europe, decided to wait on the vaccine, and they started making their own uh, vaccines rather than using American vaccines. And they had a different inactivation process, and they used less virulent strains of polio in order to do it. 
So here's a question I want to pose to you, something I actually never thought about until recently. Um, So the two questions are, given how wonderful the polio vaccine was and what a savior Jonas Salk supposedly was, how come he never won a Nobel Prize? And why wasn't he ever elected to or admitted into the National Academy of Sciences? Because these are both awards that scientists with the mythical name of Salk would have easily achieved. So how is it that everyone today thinks that Salk is a godlike figure who single-handedly wiped out polio with the revolutionary vaccine? Well, the answer to that, and this is where I'm getting into um, secondhand information, okay? But the answer to that would really rock the veneer off the saint of modern vaccinology. But here goes. Um, so the same people who blocked him from the National Academy of Sciences also made sure that he never got the Nobel Prize. And he had several dedicated people, hardworking professionals, in his lab named Dr. Julius Youngner and and Dr. or Major Byron Bennett among them. And those are the people that pretty much ran the lab. Jonas Salk did spend time in the lab, and it was always, um, whenever the photography crews came in, the lab was cleared out, Jonas put his white coat on, and he started doing his poses. And that's very well documented. There's actually a really good book written by a very pro-vaccine doctor, Oshinsky, um, who wrote a book called Polio and American Story. And he talks about Julius Youngner, what he said. Youngner died at the age of, I think it was 97, not that long ago. So he was able to continue talking about what, what it was like working with Jonas Salk. So Youngner said, there was no personal warmth, I mean none. And that was just one of his little comments. Um, but it was really a lot worse than no warmth. I think that Julius Youngner was actually just a really upstanding man and decided not to rubbish Jonas Salk the way he actually could have. Um, so Salk stole the work of Youngner at one point. So there was, I, told, I mentioned earlier that there was this test that it was a color test that showed if there was live viruses in the vaccine. And it was actually Byron Bennett that... Um, and Julius Youngner that invented that test. But Youngner wrote up the whole document, the whole paper. He gave it to Julius one night, to, um, to, sorry, to Jonas Salk one night to take home and read. And Salk came back a week later and he said, well, yeah, I lost the paper you gave me, but I, um, I, I rewrote it. So I remembered what you said and what was in it and I rewrote it. So he hands him the copy and he's the first author now. So Jonas Salk is the first author, and Youngner was, you know, obviously upset. And he talks about this in Oshinsky's book. So this was the kind of stuff that Jonas Salk was capable of doing in the lab. Um, He also had temper tantrums. Um, Dr. Robert Mendelssohn was a worker in his lab after the Cutter incident and after there was this cluster of leukemia cases that occurred, which I'll talk about soon, called the Niles Cluster. And it came through, I guess, on the, I don't know, the, how it came through, courier or whatever. And apparently Julius, um, I keep calling him Julius, Jonas Salk had a complete temper tantrum, tossed things around and threw the paper that reported the leukemia cluster into the shredder. And that was, again, secondhand information from Dr. Robert Mendelssohn. So pretty much he would steamroll anything that didn't go along with the shining reputation of his vaccine and of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis Directives. So the National Academy of Science was the place where anyone who made a genuine discovery which worked would have been admitted. So Salk knew what the people around him knew, and therefore he never complained about it. He never publicly complained saying, why didn't I get a Nobel Prize? You don't hear his son saying it either. Um, So there there was that problem, but there was also another problem, which is that this inactivation curve. And there was Dr. Dr. Major Byron Bennett, who was someone working in the lab, pretty much Jonas Salk's right-hand man, and he's pictured here um, on the left. And Major Byron Bennett kept coming back to Salk, along with the Swedish scientists saying, Jonas, this, this inactivation curve just isn't right. The formaldehyde is not doing what it should be doing. And then, um, and Salk just kept having temper tantrums, of saying, it's right, it's right, it's right. Then the Cutter incident happened. Well, after the cut, that was, that was major paralysis that happened after the 1955 vaccine uh, from live viruses being in that vaccine. And after that happened, um, Salk actually started blaming Byron Bennett for the problem. 
And he blamed him not only to his face, but he blamed him behind his back in the lab. And um, Byron Bennett was devastated because he saw that children were harmed, that children died, that some adults died, and he felt that it was a preventable problem. And now he was being blamed for it by Jonas Salk. And he was very dedicated. Um, he was extremely dedicated and committed to the work that he was done. And then he was devastated. And it turned out that he was so devastated that he actually ended his own life. And um, that was a kind of a hard obituary to find, but it's out there. I think I had to order it from, like, the New York Times or something. So, you know, uh, these are the people that were his right-hand men. And so they, there they all were in Ann Arbor the night that this, you know, stellar vaccine was being introduced, how well it worked. And Jonas Salk never acknowledged anyone any of his lab workers that night. He just stood there taking all the fanfare and all the glory. And afterwards, the, again, they tell Oshinsky, who wrote an American story, how devastated they, they the Julius Younger talked about how de devastated everybody was that Salk didn't acknowledge any of them. So that's just the kind of guy that Salk was. And everyone around him knew it. So nobody was going to you know, not nominate him because they knew that his science was bad. They knew he wasn't listening to the sound of reason. And they knew he just wasn't a very good person when it came down to working with other people. So, um, again, here is another, I just put this in again because I just wanted to drive the point home that, you know, the, the Sobin vaccine had to be brought in later. So here's another question is, why did the Sobin, oh no, 15 minutes, I'm in big trouble. Okay. Um, why did the Sobin vaccine have to be given to everybody who already had all three Salk vaccines? But they did when it was brought out. If anyone remembers that period, everybody got the Sobin vaccine. Well, the reason being is because um, there were just so many problems that were going on. And instead of admitting that Jonas Salk made a mistake, that he wouldn't listen to reason, you know, that Bernice Eddy had found SV40. I mean, there was just basically like a complete mess going on here. And so what was decided was just to um, take, bring, in, bring in the Sobin vaccine and give it to everybody and not say anything. So I just thought this was worth mentioning here. This was Dr. Dr. Archie Calocarinos from uh, Australia, and this is just something that he has been quoted as saying in an interview, and he talks about you know, the official um, policy of the World Health Organization, the Save the Children's Fund, that it's really one of murder and genocide. He said, I can't think of any other way to say it. That's just what I see, it's what I believe, that it's not, it's not the people like me, you know, him, you know, who are at the bottom being the worker bees, but the people at the top he just thought were absolutely evil. And if you, if you read his story, you will see that he had, you know, pretty much firsthand conversations with these people and what they were capable of. And it was absolutely shocking. Uh, Sven Gard um, from um, Sweden said that the whole philosophy behind the Salk vaccine was wrong. And he talked about the repeated filtrations, that they were just hunting ghosts, that the effect of filtration is nothing but a gradual removal of virus, live and dead. It could just have well been plain dilution of the vaccine. That's essentially what they did. Then um, another fellow, Dr. Stephen Chapman, reported later that he had centrifuged the vaccine and obtained live virus more than we theoretically ever could have anticipated having, which brings up the problem of reactivation. And I already mentioned that. Um, so this um, has to do with this Niles cluster that I talked about before. So this was the official study that came out. So it was known that there were these eight kids that came in a very small area that came down with leukemia. And the question was, did it have anything to do with the vaccine? Uh, so it was between 1957 and the summer of 1960, eight cases among children living in the town of Niles. So there was a significantly increased annual incidence of leukemia, 21.3 cases per 1,000 versus the baseline of 4.6 per 100,000 in Cook County. And each of these families used a different pediatrician um, and a different family physician for regular medical care. Each of them had really received three polio vaccines. So the question was there. So you can see the authors here, Clark Heath, Robert Hesterlink, well, on his deathbed, Herbert Ratner asked that this um, article that he wrote be released. And again, he's sounding the alarm bells and he's stating the facts, which again fell on deaf ears. 
And um, so what this article, Herbert Ratner's article, pretty much the summary is of it, that he says, the US polio surveillance unit overlooked or ignored the presence of live polio virus in the first two injections given, by, given to first and second graders in Chicago. The CDC assigned pretty much a Doogie Howser medical officer who was fresh out of medical school and they crowned him as being the epidemic intelligence service expert. And the new polio surveillance unit was ignored or over, and they overlooked the fact that all of the eight leukemia cases received the 1955 Salk vaccine with live polio and SV40 virus. Uh, Ratner was also highly critical of the time frames that were used in making associations between paralysis and the 1955 vaccine. But what happened was because the determination that these eight cases had nothing to do with the Salk vaccine was that even today, you know, it's pretty much set the stage for the outright denial of any relationship between childhood cancers and vaccination. Whereas Dr. Ratner, and I, I don't have time to get into this paper, but he spelled out specifically how it was actually pretty obvious if you looked at the data properly that, the, that all of these children had something in common. And it was that they got this first vaccine from 1955. And then there's this epilogue written by um, Dietz who talks about the SV40 virus there. He said there was no reference to the SV40 contamination in the 1963 journal on the Niles cluster. It's unknown whether the head officers passed on their knowledge of the presence of the SV40 contaminant to the authors of the 1963 article. Uh, so nobody really wanted to acknowledge this problem. What happened with the SV40 virus is after you know, it was discovered and, and publicized here is that it was actually sold to other countries. And, you know, so they sold huge amounts, millions of doses to New Zealand, for example, and they told the New Zealanders that the SV40 isn't a problem. Uh, we're going to give you a discount rate on this. And if you want to clean it up, just put magnesium chloride in the vaccine and that will get rid of it. So it turns out that New Zealand has one of the highest um, rates of mesotheliomas in the world. I just want to show this to you because this came from another really good book called Breakthrough, the Saga of Jonas Salk. And it's, again, it's a very pro-vaccine book, but there's a few things in here worth noting. And they talked about Congressman Percy Priest and ordered and chaired a full investigation into the vaccine controversy. And he basically said that if word ever got out that the public health service had actually done something damaging to the health of the American people, the consequences would be terrible. We felt that no lasting good could come to science. How's that for science, right? Or the public, if the public health services were discredited. And that, um, and here we have this 1984 Federal Register, which I show all the time because I think it's really important. And this is the continuation of the trust us, we know what we're doing. Um, no possible doubts whether or not well-founded about the safety of the vaccine can be allowed to exist. And fortunately that didn't work because we're all here today as evidence that the truth grows while the lie has a hard work to stay on top. And um, so this SV40 problem, um, this is just a, another article, and this was a, a presentation, um, and it, there was a discussion that happened, and Kirti Shah, who was pretty much hired um, as the guy who couldn't find SV40 if it punched him in the nose to run the studies looking for SV40 in the vaccine. Um, but somebody stood up, in the, in the, someone, one of the French scientists stood up during this conversation and said that there was more SV40 virus in the vaccines that they had than there was polio virus. And then this is um, a, an article written by Hillary Butler in 1990. She's talking about how the SV40 virus um, gave birth to genetic engineering. Um, it performs function of piggybacking other genetic material into cells. Without its discovery, genetic modification techniques would not have been accomplished that fact is worrying because it was shown from 1964 that it cross-hybridizes in humans and becomes an integral genetic factor in the creation of new viruses. And it's been confirmed in numerous places. And I'm telling you that because there's this really interesting article in New Zealand. It's a two-page little article, but it's, it's quite frightening, actually. And this Baguli in 1973... Um, talked about how there really wasn't a, a history of SS, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis that you might be familiar with. It's a terrible 100% mortality rate brain disease that generally is thought to happen after the wild poli, sorry, the wild measles virus isn't properly dealt with by the immune system and erodes the brain. Terrible, terrible disease. But they said they weren't seeing this in New Zealand until they started injecting polio vaccine. And so 
you know, I'm going to just make a long story short in the interest of time, uh, but they talked about how there was very likely an interaction between the um, SV40 virus and the measles virus. And as we know, measles virus is a virus that causes cells to kind of join together and hook together. And the supposition here was that it allowed access of the SV40 into cells in a different way than was ever than ever happened before. Um, here they talked about a probable contaminant, the SV40 of the Salk vaccine used in New Zealand, and the killed measles virus was also a possible contaminant. And the killed measles virus, there's a history of major problems with that, which I write about in Dissolving Illusions. That's why they went to the live measles virus. And they said the possibility of other contaminants can't be completely excluded. So let me just show you here that, you know, this is 1956, 57, 58, and the polio vaccine from the USA had SV40, and they came in around 1955. And, you know, just look at that peak of it. This is SSPE that happened in New Zealand. Um, so again, talking about the paramyx of viruses and the Papova virus, which is SV40, and how they can fuse together. And you know, this was the um, the question that they had. I was going to talk about Bernice Eddy and kidneys regarding SV40. Um, I was actually stunned when I realized that um, that this SV40. I, always, I knew that it was a polyoma virus, and that means you know multiple tumors, and that Bernice Eddy was injecting it. And I thought the tumors were on the skin. I didn't realize that they were actually numerous tumors that were occurring in the lungs and the kidneys. Um, and if you don't know, this SV40 virus is a monkey kidney virus, which is pretty much benign in monkeys, but becomes problematic in humans. And she talked about that here. This is just her article showing that the sarcomas happened in kidneys and lungs. and this is an article that I ran into after I stopped doing nephrology. Um, but in 2002, um, in the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology, which is a very reputable journal, they talk about this SV40, simian virus 40, um, and how it's highly prevalent in a really devastating form of kidney disease called focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis, which I dealt with, and it's absolutely miserable. This is. You know, these people generally go on to require dialysis, their kidneys shut down, they become scarred. There's no drugs that really work for it at all. And here they're showing that this FSGS, in 60% of the samples, they're finding SV40. In the HIV one, they're finding it in 50%. Um, and then as opposed to membranous which, and minimal change, which are other kidney diseases, they're only finding it in 20%, but they're still finding it. And they even say here that the SV40 may contribute to the pathogenesis of kidney disease, particularly FSGS. And just to show you what that is, this is the glomerulus, uh, is the filter of the kidney. And there are millions of them in the kidneys. And this is what a normal filter should look like. And see the space out here is nice. That's where the urine goes in. And this is a scarred one from FSGS. And this is another view. And so it's a really problematic uh, kidney disease. And they find that SV40 is present in the urine cells of 41% of FSGS cases. Other kidney diseases, they're only finding in 10%. Healthy volunteers, 4%. And in the biopsies, as I showed you, 50% versus 20%. Um, again, they say it's possibly that it initiates renal injury by acting as a progression factor. Now, the problem is that this virus was introduced into the human population. It should have never been here. But it didn't just end when we stopped injecting it with, or and swallowing it with the vaccines because we can pass it on to our children and we can pass it to each other. So it's pretty much in the human population to stay. So the best defense against it, in my opinion, is to keep your immune system as strong as possible. But they knew about this. Like in 1962, uh, Harvey Schein was writing about the simian virus that was transforming kidney cells. And there were two articles. Um, talking about the cytopathogenic cell transforming, you know, basically making immortal cell lines by using this uh, virus. And here we have just the curve of, you know, kidney cancers going up over that period of time. Um, this is just an article, really interesting article, where Dr. Michelle Carboni uh, is an Italian gentleman scientist, um, and Fang Qi talking about how. Um, it's really difficult to get SV40 research. Nobody wants to fund it. And they, you know, they're basically saying it's the controversy has paralyzed the research field. But more interestingly, um, it's from one of my favorite books called The Virus and the Vaccine, 
which reads like a mystery novel. I highly recommend it. Um, but this is Dr. Carboni when he was younger, and he says that um, Dr. Levine told me that if I or Harvey talked to the press against his wishes, we would be punished. Dr. Harvey Pass was shocked at the uproar, particularly the threat. He said, I didn't think you got punished for science. Um, so there was an attempt to look at SB40. It was a pretty feeble attempt. They had 1,000 children, and they were supposed to follow them over their lifetime. And uh, what happened was that they dropped the study after 19 years. They said it was too difficult to follow up on these uh, SB40 exposed children. But they still had access to 87% of them. So that would really have been the time to start the study, not to end the study. So that study was pretty much killed. I'm actually almost done. I'm probably going to get through. So give me maybe six minutes instead of five. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to end with saying that, you know, polio is still here. Don't be deluded. You know, the pol polio viruses may have been gone, but in a 1958 <laughs> epidemic in Michigan, when they actually tested for polio virus in the stools and the blood of people that had clinical poliomyelitis, they were diagnosed in their medical charts as poliomyelitis. They found that only about a quarter of them had polio virus. The rest had echovirus, Coxsackie virus, um, or no virus at all associated. So um, the vaccine really, you know, if anything, maybe the oral vaccine could have had some um, something to do with the elimination of the polio virus, but the entity of poliomyelitis is here to stay, and it's actually gotten worse. And, and I always also find it interesting that we're told that, you know, polio became a problem because of hygiene, because the children weren't exposed to it anymore, and the mothers weren't giving them immunity during the time when they would have been exposed the first time. But now we're told in India that, you know, it's a problem in India. Well, you cannot blame India for having too much hygiene. Okay, so polio is a major problem in India. And so I just want to point this out because this used to be data on the World Health Organization's website, but it's no longer there. And what you see here at the, on the bottom is polio, virus-associated polio, okay? And they're celebrating because, look, it went from here down to here. They have this great success of eliminating polio at least to some degree. But up here is acute flaccid paralysis, <laughs> you know, which is pretty much polio. And so you know, there were 60,000 new cases in 2011. And so this is um, AFP polio-like here. And so one of them is the world, and one of them is India. Too so small for me to see. This is, you know, we see this in the news now. This is from 2016, I believe, about this polio-like illness in USA children. And it affected a, you know, hundreds of children in the USA. You know, we hear little whispers of it here. It's pretty much in 100% of vaccinated children. Okay, so polio today is a disease of vaccinated people. Uh, this comes from the CDC's website showing the peaks that happened in 2014, 2016. And they just say, keep getting your vaccines and wash your hands. That's what the CDC website says. Then there's transverse myelitis. And, and, you know, I, I quote this often, Dr. Douglas Kerr from Johns Hopkins in his forward to the autoimmune epidemic talks about how there are hundreds of cases of ventilator-dependent polio that's called transverse myelitis. And that would have all been called polio in 1954. It was in 1955 that they changed the definitions. This is what today's iron lung looks like. And I have a friend who has a husband who had a terrible pain in his leg and a febrile illness. And after the febrile illness resolved, that's what his leg looked like. And there's another view of it. He's got polio. He walks with a foot drop. He rides a bike. He does quite well for himself. He complete denial about there being any problem whatsoever. But nonetheless, he had polio as far as I'm concerned. But the board was never mentioned to him. It was a mystery as far as I understand. I asked a lot of questions, and I was just told that there was no name for it. Nobody knew what happened, and it's resolved. And with that, I end. Thank you. Hi, yes. Dr. Humphreys. <laughs> Isn't it true that the Indian government, you made reference to India and all the polio cases, and that the Indian government is suing Gavi and Bill Gates for all the polio cases, 47,500? Um, you know, I've seen the news articles. Uh, I, I guess I'm just still skeptical on, on any positive outcome happening from that. I just feel that Bill Gates is kind of impermeable in his empire. But I have, I have also read about that, but I don't know any of the details. 
Um, two things. One is the Rockefeller uh, quote you talked about at the beginning. Why, why would they um, create this right. effect? That was one. And the second, because you talk more about India, why India is showing the graph that you showed okay. in India. Well, so India, you know, if you want to get DDT, you know, you can pretty much get it in any store in India from what I, how I understand it. There are two countries that still manufacture it, it's India and China. And so you can get DDT off the shelf in pretty much any store. They use it still to, for mosquito control. Um, and so there's still a lot of, you know, toxic spraying that's going on there. Um, why else? I don't know, but I can tell you that there, oh, I can tell you actually, is that the oral polio vaccine um, campaign there, it's called pulse polio vaccine. They will sometimes give children 35 oral polio vaccines by their fifth birthday. And this is actually in Dissolving Illusions, and I show the graph and Dr. Jacob Pouliel talking about how, you know, the rates of paralysis and the severity and death rate are much higher in those children, and it's linearly related to the amount of vaccines that are received. Um, I also, sorry, one more thing. They also love injections in India. You know, when Indian people are sick, they go to the doctor and they will, they'll give a lot of antibiotic injections because it's easier to just give them a shot than it is than to give them a prescription and have them continue taking pills. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had not heard a lot of people talk about Hillary Kaprowski and some of that pioneering work in Africa and the potential relation to some of the other pandemic problems like HIV AIDS and I'd, I'd be curious to hear you know what your perception is on that you know every time I've talked about monkey viruses and AIDS somebody brutally attacks me so I just walked away and I was like fine I, I, go ahead believe whatever you want to believe about the polio vaccine and the monkey viruses and HIV um, so I pretty much stay away from it but there's a really good book by doc, by Ed Hooper called the river that has a huge amount, it's a beautifully written book. It's really difficult to get through, <laughs> but there's a lot of good information about that there. I just want to add on that because I was re-looking at the references in my book that a lot of people have actually gone against what he said because the studies that he's calling upon were saying that's, that's not true, but then there was further rebuttal, and I think what you were saying about how they took that polio vaccine or that it was being made in other countries, that there was a Netherlands group that then was taking the whatever the stock was and taking it to Africa and incubated on a different kind of monkey's kidneys in Africa because that was the local source and it was those those sources that were specific to the HIV virus that went out like that. So it's just usually there, there's a group of people that don't believe that HIV is a virus and that it's not, you know, those are usually the ones that attack me and I just thought it's not worth it because I actually haven't researched HIV enough. I've not been willing to go down that bunny hole, but I think there probably is something to what they're saying. I just don't, I have not done, looked on the research myself. Yeah, if you could go back to that chart, I'm still not clear I'd about... be better if I just show you, yeah. you know, afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Because it is kind of hard to see. If you, so if you didn't understand my description, I'll have to show it to you up close. It's uh, in the book too. Yeah, um, thank you for your book. Um, it's been very much an eye opener for me. Uh, I was utterly shocked by, you know, the polio story that you had. Um, my question is, that's the first time I've ever heard of this other story. When I first read your book, how did you get all that information? Like, is that? Oh uh, yeah, I'll anywhere? tell you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I started with. I actually remembered. I I, st I stumped myself earlier. I was trying to tell you that the joke was the infantile foundation for national paralysis. That's what they would jokingly call the NFIP, <laughs> the infantile foundation for national paralysis. Um, I started. I found Herbert Ratner's article, um, and that's the place to start. And then after that, I found. Um, Janine Roberts' Fear of the Invisible, and I just devoured that and got as many of the references as I could. And then um, I found Tim O'Shea's book, um, uh, Vaccination is Not Immunization, and it all started from there. And then I just fanned out. Then Herbert Ratner's daughter, I don't remember how we got in contact, and then Sherry Tenpenny dumped like 20 you know, piles on me of stuff that she had saved. And so Herbert Ratner's daughter gave me all of his archives from his office. And at that point, I was just bathing in polio information. <laughs> yeah. And there's still stuff I haven't gotten through. I mean, I'd love for someone to take those. We, I finally, okay, the United States Polio Surveillance Unit documents of the paralysis rates after the vaccine were wiped out of every library 
as far as we knew in the world. You could get them from one library in DC, but you had to have a special access. I actually have them. I just haven't had time to um, go through the data. Well, I don't know. I just know that they're not there for the public to view. Was there a virus release that made the 1954 polio spike like there was in 1916? Not that I'm aware of, but who knows? I mean, yeah. at, at that point, there were a lot of things going on that I, I talk about. And there's another talk that I did a few years ago, mm -hmm. 2012. Mm -hmm. You know, but that was, you know, at that point, breastfeeding was really not popular at all. Breast milk was very protective against this problem. And the milk that was used was DDT tainted. So DDT of yesterday is kind of like the glyphosate of today. <laughs> and so there were a lot of things going on then besides the spraying and, you know, the dietary changes. You know, I, I grew up with two smoking parents who would have the, you know, both the windows up in the car smoking cigarettes, you know. So there was all kinds of crazy stuff going on in the 1950s and 60s that could have contributed to that. Okay, thanks.